Hello students, this is Professor McDermott uh, with another video lecture for History 2111. In this lecture we're going to cover sort of a grab bag of um, topics to help you get ready for your second exam which is coming up very soon. Um, but first we need to uh, finish with the War of 1812. Uh, we talked about the aspect of the war as a struggle by Indians and African Americans to resist um, the United States government. Um, as far as the fighting went between the United States and Great Britain, a lot of it was actually at sea or um, on the Great Lakes. So there were some very important naval battles during the War of 1812. Um, as far as the fighting on land went, it was mostly quite embarrassing <laughs> for the United States, and the, the low point for the U.S. came in August 1814, when uh, British troops sailed into Chesapeake Bay, um, got out at Washington, D.C., and burnt it to the ground, uh, including uh, the White House, and uh, James and Dolly Madison uh, just managed to get away in the nick of time without being... Um, captured and fortunately Dolly Madison was able to save a lot of the famous paintings and uh, treasures of, of, of the White House uh, as they escaped. But it was certainly a humiliating moment for uh, the United States of America, the burning of Washington in August 1814. Then the British set their sights on um, Baltimore and um, began to bombard uh, Fort McHenry with cannon from their ships. And it was a very interesting episode. So there was a young man named Francis Scott Key. He was an attorney in Baltimore, and the city leaders had sent him out to one of the British ships uh, to negotiate. And so he was stuck on the ship all night long watching as uh, the British cannon fired away at uh, Fort McHenry in Baltimore. And then uh, when the sun came up the next morning, he saw to his delight that the American flag was still flying over uh, the fort and it had not surrendered. And so he went home and wrote um, a poem uh, about that event, which later was set to music and of course became uh, years later, our, our national anthem, the, uh, the Star-Spangled Banner, uh, really uh, recording this, uh, this incident at Fort McHenry in Baltimore in September of 1814. One uh, American victory on land uh, during the War of 1812 took place in January of 1815. General um, Andrew Jackson, now uh, a general, had gone down to New Orleans after his victory at um, Horseshoe Bend and uh, managed to hold off 7,500 British uh, regular troops, defeating them in just uh, 30 minutes. This was really a um, very decisive victory for Jackson in um, the Battle of New Orleans, and it was really this battle that made him a huge celebrity. Um, in the United States and, of course, a future uh, presidential candidate. Uh, what was odd about the Battle of New Orleans was that actually <laughs> peace had already been uh, negotiated between the U.S. and Britain, and the war was over when the battle was fought. Um, actually, in December of 1814 in Ghent in Belgium, uh, U.S. and British envoys uh, worked out a peace treaty uh, but, of course, the news of that took a while to get across the Atlantic, and so Jackson had no idea that uh, he was fighting in a war that was already over when he won the Battle of New Orleans. Um, the Treaty of Ghent really was kind of anticlimactic, um, and in a sense showed how futile this war was, because all it said was that England and Britain were going back, England and the U.S. were going back to the way things were, at the beginning of the war, that nothing um, nothing had changed. Um, and so really many people in the country were quite bitter about uh, the War of 1812. People called it Mr. Madison's War, and uh, they wondered what it had all been for, especially people in um, New England, where the economy had suffered quite a bit with the, the interruption of trade to uh, Great Britain. Um, and actually, in Hartford, Connecticut, in 1815, 
Um, the Federalist Party, what was left of it, called a convention of New England delegates. Um, and actually, it was at this Hartford Convention of 1815 for the first time that the idea of secession from the Union was brought up. But it was not secession of the South, as we'd see later before the Civil War. This time it was the northern states who were um, interested in the idea of seceding because they were so disgusted with um, the Madison uh, administration. Uh, well, the North did not secede. Um, instead, the Hartford Convention called for a series of constitutional amendments to try to reduce the power of the South and the national government. None of the amendments passed, and really the convention did not amount to much. But um, it is an interesting sidelight that the first time secession was actually brought up in the United States, it was done by the North, not by the South. Well, uh, it's interesting, too, that those northern states were beginning to feel uh, the first signs of the Industrial uh, Revolution in America. Really, you could date the Industrial Revolution in the U.S. back to the arrival of a man named Samuel Slater in 1789. Slater was British. He had worked in the British textile industry, that is, the cloth-making industry, um, which was by far the most advanced in the world. I already mentioned that the British were far ahead of every other nation in terms of industrialization. Um, and uh, when Slater came to the United States, he brought with him knowledge of how the machines were constructed and operated that the British were using um, in the textile industry. And Slater began to make his own machines, like the one in this um, picture. So uh, previously, uh, how thread was spun, you would have usually a woman in her home with one of those old-fashioned um, spinning wheels operated by hand or by foot power, and um, she would spin wool or cotton into thread, um, but could only produce one strand, one spool of thread at a time. But Slater invented this machine which would allow an operator to fill up 96 different bobbins of thread, 96 different strands of thread all at the same time. So this was really uh, the beginning of a revolutionary development um, in, in, in U.S. manufacturing. Uh, I mentioned before the important impact of the cotton gin uh, invented by Eli Whitney in 1793, and this meant that there was a lot more raw material, a lot more cotton being produced to feed the growing demand from uh, New England textile manufacturers. But it was not until 1823 that we can say industrialization really gets started in the United States. And it happened in a very specific place, the town of Lowell, Massachusetts, where some entrepreneurs built um, factories, textile mills, that uh, interestingly were staffed by exclusively young women, young unmarried women. Um, they were nearly all farm girls from, from nearby villages and rural areas. Um, their families needed extra income, so they allowed their daughters to come and live at Lowell in a dormitory and uh, work in um, the textile mills. And so uh, really, the pioneers of manufacturing, you could say, were these uh, in the United States were these young women of um, Lowell, Massachusetts. But of course, the composition of the workforce would change as industrialism advanced in the United States of America. And generally, the way things played out uh, was like this. So before industrialization, um, cloth or really any other product, would be made in a workshop in a town where you would have a master workman uh, who had some uh, employees called journeymen and then usually some apprentices, young men who were learning their trade and, and hoping to become master craftsmen in their own right. But uh, when the new machines began to be introduced uh, that allowed the mass production of cloth and other goods, um, those master craftsmen who were wealthy enough to buy the machines 
would do so. They would establish factories and uh, they were the big winners of industrialization because as factory owners they were able to move up into the upper middle class and uh, generally became quite wealthy. Um, in other words, they became the people we call capitalists, people who had a lot of capital, a lot of wealth. Um, the losers basically were everybody else, <laughs> the poor masters who couldn't afford the machines, and also the journeyman employees and the apprentices uh, who hadn't yet made the rank of master. Those people, with the destruction of the old workshops, were out of a job and uh, generally had to go to work in the new factories um, as wage laborers with very little prospect of advancement. And so we see here the creation of the working class um, in America, um, composed of men and women in the 19th century. Many women uh, as well as men worked in these factories and even children uh, working very long hours, not going to school. Um, and so this is really the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the U.S., but it would take several decades, really, um, for this to development to gain mo momentum and really become a huge part of the economy. But mostly, early on, that happened in the North, not the South. And as time went on, um, really, the workforce in the factories became uh, primarily poor immigrants. Um, mostly from Europe, uh, who came over because of hardship and difficulty in their home countries. Um, and of course the most famous example of this is the massive Irish immigration um, following the Irish potato famine that started in 1845. So um, earlier in the course we talked about how the potato had become a very important staple crop throughout Europe and, and, and the Irish especially had become dependent on potatoes for sustenance. In fact, um, usually an Irish person ate nothing, almost nothing but potatoes. <laughs> they grew other crops and they raised cattle and sheep and so forth, but all of those other farm products generally were exported to England for the tables of um, wealthy Englishmen and the Irish were left to eat potatoes. Um, you had to eat about 10 pounds of potatoes every day to get enough nutrition to survive. Uh, so there was a big demand for potatoes in Ireland, but in 1845 the potato crop was hit with a fungus that uh, essentially destroyed it, and immediately Ireland was sunk into a terrible famine that lasted for four years in which about one million uh, people died in Ireland. And uh, as a result of this, uh, even more people, about 1.7 million, left Ireland and came to the United States between 1840 and um, 1860. But um, these Irish immigrants were not, by and large, welcomed by uh, the American population, um, and especially by Protestant evangelical Christians who would later join the Whig party that we'll talk about shortly um, because the Irish of course were nearly all Roman Catholics and as such they were considered to be dangerous um, to the country and many people were hostile to these Irish um, immigrants and also Irish people were really subject to a lot of degrading um, stereotypes. Uh, if you look at the cartoon on the right, you see a typical portrayal of an Irishman. Uh, he's standing there on the left, and you notice he looks almost like an ape, uh, or like a monkey, not really human at all. And um, he looks very angry and, and hostile, not someone you would want to meet in a dark alley. He's carrying a knife and a large club, which the Irish would have called a shillelagh. Um, so he just looks very dangerous, very sinister, not very intelligent, not someone you would want to have living um, on your block. Um, and uh, it's interesting that there was only one major organization in the United States that actually welcomed the Irish immigrants, and, and that was the Democratic Party. 
Um, because in those days, the laws were much more relaxed than they are today as far as um, voting requirements for immigrants. Nowadays, you'd have to wait several years, apply for citizenship, take a test, and then and only then would you be able to vote. But in the 19th century, uh, immigrants could vote almost as soon as they got off the boat from Europe as long as they could, as long as they would swear that they were going to become a U.S. citizen someday. They were put on the voting rolls. And the Democrats realized that this was a huge source of um, potential new voters. And so they took steps to um, try to, to welcome those people, to help them get jobs, uh, a lot of times government jobs, say on the police force or what have you, the fire department, um, and to really smooth over this transition for, um, for these immigrants. But um, this was part of the Democratic Party's uh, reputation for being corrupt in the 19th century. You notice in the cartoon that the Irishman and his priest are carving up a goose, which is labeled... Um, Democratic Party. And so there's this idea that this evil Catholic influence in, uh, and the influence of Irish immigrants is going to destroy uh, the Democratic Party and damage the United States of America. Another immigrant group that came in great numbers to the United States in the mid-19th century were people from uh, Germany. Um, and they were fleeing from famine, but also from religious persecution and from political um, violence that was taking place there in the German states. Uh, between 1840 and 1860, about 1 1.4 million Germans came to this country. But their path uh, as new Americans generally was very different from that of um, the Irish. Um, Germans tended to come over with at least some education, the ability to read and write, usually with at least some money or resources and skills. And so um, they could often afford um, to go into the heartland of America, places like Missouri or later Kansas, Nebraska, places on the Great Plains, and buy land or set themselves up as... Um, small businessmen, shop owners, or often uh, brewers, uh, the great American breweries like Pabst, Stanheiser Busch, Miller, Schlitz, um, were all founded by German immigrants during this, uh, during this time period. Uh, and so the Germans uh, often became quite prosperous quickly, not so the Irish. Um, the Irish, when they came over, were usually illiterate, often starving, and generally had nothing but the clothes on their backs. And so they had no choice but to stay in the large cities wherever they disembarked from the ships and to try to get work wherever they could, often in uh, the new factories that were springing up in northern cities like New York or Boston or um, Philadelphia. So it's really the Irish who become the backbone of the labor force um, in these uh, northern factories during the Industrial Revolution. Um, just want to mention one last topic with respect to immigrants. Um, immigrants, especially Irish Catholic immigrants, were so unpopular in America that at one point an ac a political party sprang up that was actually entire, almost entirely devoted to uh, opposing immigration. And this party was known as uh, the Know Nothing Party, uh, uh, sort of uh, colloquially. Um, their official name was the Order of United Americans, but people called them the Know Nothing Party because they were very secretive. And uh, if you ask someone, are you a member of this party? Um, they, um, they, um, they, would, they would say, <laughs> so they became known as the Know Nothings. And uh, they won a lot of elections in the mid 1850s. And for a while, it look, looked like they might even become the main opposition party to the Democrats. But um, uh, as the slavery issue became more prevalent uh, up in the years running up to the Civil War, the Republicans emerged as um, the main opposition party and, and the Know Nothings faded into oblivion. But it just goes to show you the depth of anti-immigrant feeling
course, immigration is a huge topic of conversation in our country now, but um, this hostility to immigrants or, or fear or genuine concerns about immigrants is, is really nothing new uh, in our nation. All right, well, let's go back again a little bit in time. We got a little ahead of ourselves there. <laughs> uh, but uh, going back a bit to August 1807 and the beginnings of what historians call the transportation revolution um, in this country. And um, really, you know, in the United States before 1807, it was very hard to get from point A to point B roads were very primitive, almost non-existent in um, many places. And the best way to travel was by uh, water uh, on the sea or on a river, but that could often be unpredictable, um, you know, with uh, you have to deal with winds and currents and weather and so forth. But in August 1807, a young inventor named Robert Fulton um, took an important step which made river transportation much more safe and reliable. Uh, he had invented a new contraption that he called a steamboat. And uh, he sent his steamboat, named the Clermont, on a test run between New York City up the Hudson River to Albany, and it was a stunning um, success. And pretty soon Fulton's steamboat was um, plying the waters everywhere. Uh, throughout the United States, down the Ohio River, the Mississippi River, and it really had a tremendous um, effect on what we call the market revolution, the opening up of uh, commercial markets throughout the country. Um, in 1811, just, just so you see the contrast here, in 1811, the entire Mississippi River Valley region only produced about 5 million pounds of cotton. But by 1830, uh, 200 million pounds, um, a 40-fold increase. You know, that is, is really striking. And it was because uh, Fulton Steamboat made it much easier to get your cotton to market. Uh, typically, cotton growers would send um, their crops down uh, the Mississippi River to New Orleans uh, to be sold. And this really made cotton farming even more economical and profitable than it had been before, and um, drew a lot of those Western farmers into commercial markets for the first time. Another development in terms of transportation um, was initiated by the governor of New York, uh, DeWitt Clinton, who um, wanted to build a canal, a man-made waterway, between Albany, New York on the Hudson River and Buffalo, New York on um, Lake Erie. And, and people said he was absolutely crazy, uh, that this would never work. Um, but Clinton was determined. It took about eight years, uh, but finally in 1825 the Erie Canal was opened and absolutely revolutionized um, transportation and in many ways commerce in the United States because suddenly uh, let's say you were a farmer in some very remote place like Minnesota or, or, or northern Michigan um, now you could put your crop on a boat it could sail through the Great Lakes down the Erie Canal down the Hudson River <clears throat> and all the way to New York City and then from there it could even possibly be shipped on to Europe and so um, really the Erie Canal was revolutionary in terms of connecting people, um, especially farmers in very remote frontier areas, to uh, broader markets uh, in uh, on the East Coast and, and, and really um, throughout the world. And so um, it had a tremendous impact on the economy, on people's mobility, and on American life as a whole. Well, turning to a different topic now, um, we already discussed the great religious revival in the 18th century known as the First Great Awakening, and that had died down somewhat during the Revolutionary War period. Um, but those religious concerns again sprang to the forefront in um, 1801, 
at a very unlikely place, a very remote uh, location called Cane Ridge, Kentucky, where a revival was held that attracted about 12,000 people from the entire countryside all around, no doubt looking just for company <laughs> and, and a feeling of community, um, as well as uh, a religious awakening. And the revival, this revival and all the revivals of the Second Great Awakening were similar to those during the First Great Awakening in that people were still seeking that new birth experience, that born-again experience that would tell them that they were predestined to go to heaven. Um, but this revival <laughs> set a new tone um, for this new Great Awakening in that uh, very strange things, or stra things that seemed strange to more conservative religious people began to take place. So, for example, people began speaking in tongues, shouting, falling out on the floor in a trance, um, sometimes even laughing hysterically or barking like dogs, going through strange contortions um, in their bodies. Um, all of these things were seen as signs of the presence of um, the Holy Spirit, and indeed became a kind of religious language for many people in America. Later, uh, a church called the Pentecostal Church would be born out of another religious revival in 1906, and uh, Pentecostals do embrace uh, this sort of manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Uh, some of you who are listening to this may even be Pentecostal uh, and have experienced these things. So uh, again, we see here how this, this second Great Awakening, like the first, would have a major impact on American religious life. And uh, really, it was the Second Great Awakening that led to the tremendous growth of um, the Baptist Church, which previously had been quite small, as well as the newly founded Methodist uh, religion. Um, especially in the South, the Baptists and Methodists conducted most of the Southern revivals, while in the North, Presbyterians and Congregationalists generally um, sponsored uh, the revival meetings, which spread like wildfire through frontier regions. Um, Western New York became known as the Burned Over District, um, not because of forest fires, but because it had been burned over by the Holy Spirit and, and revival after revival. And it was not an accident, if you look at the map there in the state of New York, it was not an accident that the Erie Canal ran right through western New York. Um, historians have suggested that, as with the First Great Awakening, perhaps people were starting to feel a little anxious, that they were making money hand over fist by shipping goods down the canal, and, and perhaps felt a little nervous about that, that once again they were losing that religious intensity that their ancestors had had. But whatever uh, may have been the reason that sparked the revivals, uh, they did spread dramatically. And uh, many people from New England um, moved westward so as to lead uh, revivals in frontier communities and try to attract people to the Christian religion. And so the revivals in the Second Great Awakening became uh, kind of a, a means or a vector by which New Englanders, Yankee culture, began to permeate um, regions of the Old Northwest, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. Uh, although there were also many people of Southern background in those areas as well. Well, what about the slavery issue? Um, had died down somewhat uh, after the compromises we talked about in the Constitution. There wasn't a great deal of discussion of slavery in the country um, until 1819, uh, when Missouri, uh, part of the Louisiana Purchase, uh, applied for statehood as a slave state. And this caused uh, a big controversy, partly because it was adjacent to Illinois, um, and uh, it, it seemed many people thought that, like the old Northwest region, that it should be become free. Uh, without without slavery. Um, and so a representative in the House, uh, James Talmadge, um, 
suggested that Missouri be admitted, but that a gradual emancipation bill be introduced so all their slaves would be freed over time and that no new slaves should be brought into Missouri. And uh, the issue of Missouri statehood caused just a firestorm of um, controversy. Uh, and um, what finally wound up happening was that Henry Clay, now the Speaker of the House of Representatives from Kentucky, stepped forward and brokered another great legislative um, deal that became known as the Missouri Compromise. And for this, Clay became known as the Great Pacificator, the Great Peacemaker. So what was this Missouri Compromise that um, Clay uh, worked out? in 1820. Well, Missouri did come into the Union as a slave state, but at the same time, uh, Maine, at the north uh, right-hand corner of your map there, was also admitted as a free state, so that helped to maintain the balance between slave and free states. And furthermore, the Missouri Compromise held that every other, uh, well, basically it drew a line through the Louisiana Purchase. And you see the line there, it's at 36 degrees, 30 minutes of north latitude, the, 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 the southern border of Missouri. And, and basically it was established that every other territory north of that line besides Missouri would always be free, while uh, the territory south of it could come in as uh, slave territory or slave states. Um, and so uh, this was the Missouri Compromise, and it did help to calm the controversy for um, about 30 years over slavery. But it was like a warning sign to the country that the slavery issue was not going to go away. Jefferson called this Missouri dispute a fire bell in the night, uh, an alarm, something that would wake you up, that would startle you during the night. Um, and Jefferson predicted that there would be trouble uh, in the future. You may ask, again, if the Founding Fathers like Jefferson, Madison, Washington all knew slavery was wrong, why didn't they take steps to, to stop it? Um, well, here's another <laughs> quote from Jefferson. Um, Jefferson at one point said that slavery was like a boy who had a wolf by the ears. He was in trouble whether he held on or let go. <laughs> you have to picture that, a boy holding a wolf by the ears. Well, whatever he did, you know, basically he was toast, you know. Um, and that was the attitude of the Founding Fathers towards slavery. They would have liked to freed all the slaves, but um, they feared the consequences. They feared what would happen if you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of slaves were freed suddenly and turned out into the job market without any education, without any skills, without any money or resources, without even being able to read or, or write. Uh, what would happen to them? What would happen to the country? Um, would unscrupulous politicians be able to manipulate them uh, by their votes? Um, somehow use them against the system or to, to, uh, to cause a revolution that would undermine the system. There were all kinds of fears that may seem kind of silly to us. Now, in hindsight, of course, we'd say, yes, of course they should have freed all the slaves at once. It was a terrible human rights violation, terrible violation of human dignity. But um, the Founding Fathers at least felt or feared that the consequences of freeing all the slaves at once might be even worse than continuing the slave system. And so, in a sense, they believed um, that uh, they were stuck. Of course, so uh, in the end, it would take a bloody, terribly devastating conflict to bring about the end of slavery um, that, uh, that many Americans in this early period desired. Well, uh, James Madison stepped down after two terms as president, and uh, the election of 1816 was won by yet another Virginian, James Monroe. Um, so uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the first four of the first five presidents were from Virginia, and sometimes uh, people call this the Virginia dynasty, although as it turned out, Monroe would be the last 
of the Virginia dynasty. Monroe served two terms, and his um, presidency, aside from the Missouri conflict, his presidency was generally uh, quite uh, peaceful. And in fact, uh, the Federalist Party had basically completely disappeared by this point in time. Only the Republicans were left, so essentially there was only one political party that everyone belonged to. And uh, so this period of the Monroe administration became known as the Era of Good Feelings, where there really wasn't a great deal of uh, political controversy. The act that Monroe is perhaps most famous for um, took place in 1823, and it had to do with revolutions that were taking place in uh, Latin America, South America, Central America. Uh, countries were declaring their independence from Spain and Portugal, um, having revolutions and establishing themselves as independent republics. And um, Monroe was afraid that other European powers, <clears throat> besides Spain and Portugal, might try to step in and take over some of those newly independent countries. And so he issued a statement that became known as the Monroe Doctrine, in which he said that um, from that point forward, uh, after 1823, the Western Hemisphere, North and South America, would be a United States sphere of influence. In other words, the United States was taking the responsibility to ensure the well-being of the Western Hemisphere, and that European powers had better stay out. Um, and uh, this Monroe Doctrine has had a tremendous influence on U.S. foreign policy ever since the United States has felt like it has had a special role to play in this hemisphere as far as keeping the peace, um, trying to solve problems, prevent disasters, and so forth. And so there have been many, many times that our, our troops have intervened in foreign countries in this hemisphere. Uh, based on uh, the Monroe Doctrine of 1823. But uh, James Monroe retired, uh, did not run for re-election in 1824. And uh, although the previous eight years have been known as the era of good feelings, suddenly a lot of hidden um, hostility and anger came out in the election of 1824, which was one of the most controversial in American history. There were four presidential candidates in that year. All of them were from the Republican Party. Um, John Quincy Adams of Massachusetts, the son of our second president, John Adams. Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson the hero of the Battle of New Orleans. Henry Clay of Kentucky and W.H. Crawford from South Carolina. Um, and you see that Jackson in the vote total there on the left actually got more electoral votes than any of the other candidates and he got more popular votes as well but he did not manage to win a majority in the electoral college and as we learned earlier with the election of 1800 when that happens the election goes into the House of um, Representatives where Henry Clay <laughs> as speaker was the most powerful figure and so uh, what wound up happening was that Clay, through his support to John Quincy Adams, and Adams was elected president by the House, and then what do you know, John Quincy Adams turned around and nominated as his Secretary of State none other than Henry Clay. <laughs> and Jackson's supporters smelled a rat. In fact, they were furious at what they called the corrupt bargain between Clay and Adams. Clay trading his votes in the House for uh, the position of Secretary of State. And so the uh, belief in this corrupt bargain really ruined Adams's presidency in a way, and he would turn out to be a one-term um, president, uh, largely because of the resentment that Jackson's supporters felt for him after the election of 1824. And so uh, Adams would be voted out in 1828, and the president, of course, would be Andrew Jackson, swept into office on a tide of indignation about that 1824, excuse me, 1824 election. Uh, Andrew Jackson was unique uh, in many ways as uh, president. He was from Tennessee, 
Uh, that made him the first person from west of the Appalachian Mountains to be elected president. Um, and so it was the beginning of a new era. Um, he was, of course, a general, and American voters love um, voting for generals. We have elected generals as president several times in our history. Uh, after the War of 1812, he had uh, led the uh, military campaign in Florida in 1818, in the Seminole War, which ultimately resulted in the U.S. getting uh, Florida, annexing Florida in 1819. Uh, Jackson was the leader of a new political party, which uh, emerged from the wreckage of the Republican Party that would become known as the Democratic Party. And in fact, the Democratic Party we have today is the same Democratic Party that was founded by Andrew Jackson in um, 1828. And the purpose of the Democratic Party essentially was to make America more democratic, to um, remove all restrictions to voting so that more adult male citizens would have um, the right to vote. Now you have to understand that before 1828 there were a great many tests or requirements that you had to pass in order to vote in, in most states. So for instance, some states had a property requirement. You were not allowed to vote um, unless you had a certain amount of property or uh, land. Um, and so there had been kind of an elitist approach to voting before Jackson. But after the 1824 election and the outrage that it caused, a lot of states removed those requirements. And so you see um, that the number of voters really skyrocketed between 1824 and 1828 throughout the country uh, from about 366,000 in 1824 to um, 1.148 million in 1828, almost a threefold uh, increase. And so this really signaled a new era when um, educated uh, wealthy elites were not going to be able to control the political process any longer. And increasingly poor, illiterate, uneducated people, sometimes immigrants, were able to let their political power be felt um, in the United States. And a lot of that had to do with President Andrew Jackson. He showed his appreciation for the mass of common people um, at his inaugural address. So when before he gave his speech, before he said anything, he bowed very low to the people who had assembled to listen to him, bowed to the majesty of the people, acknowledging that they were the ones who had put him in the White House. They were the ones who had elected him, and, and, and really, they were the sovereign, uh, we the people. They were the ones who are in control of the country, really, and he was only their faithful servant. So. Uh, in all things, Jackson tried to promote what he saw as the interests of the ordinary American against um, business interests, wealth, wealthy elites. Um, but uh, <laughs> there was kind of an embarrassing moment at Jackson's uh, inaugural. Uh, so many of Jackson's rowdy friends and supporters had come to Washington for the party. And... Um, at the inaugural ball at the White House, um, some of them got so drunk that they actually began trashing um, the White House until finally someone got the bright idea to move all the alcohol out onto the lawn and get everybody out of the house, which fortunately saved the White House from almost total destruction. Um, all right. Um, now, Jackson was a very controversial president. He was an incredibly important president, I think perhaps one of the three most important presidents in terms of his impact on the office of the presidency. Um, and he made the presidency much more assertive, much more powerful. Uh, one of the ways that he did that was through his use of the veto power. Now, of course, the president has the power to veto laws passed um, by Congress, and uh, that means he refuses to sign them, refuses to sign them into law. Uh, previous presidents had used the veto very rarely. 
and usually only because they thought that a law passed by Congress was unconstitutional. But Jackson vetoed laws quite frequently and uh, simply because he disagreed with them. Uh, so in other words, he was using the veto to advance his own political agenda. Um, the most famous example of this came in 1832 when um, Congress tried to uh, produce a new charter for the Bank of the United States, which had been created by Alexander Hamilton as part of his financial system. Um, Jackson hated the bank. He hated big money interests. He hated big business. He saw the bank as a way uh, for moneyed interests to bring corruption into the government, and in this he was very much the heir of Jefferson politically, and so Jackson vetoed the bank bill. And uh, that ultimately led to the uh, elimination, the, the, the destruction of the Bank of the United States. And so um, Jackson's use of the veto was very controversial. Another decision he made that was also highly controversial uh, had to do with the uh, Indian tribe known as the Cherokee. The Cherokee lived in um, East Tennessee, Western North Carolina, and in Northwestern Georgia. Like the Creeks, they were considered to be one of the five civilized tribes of Indians because they too had adopted American culture pretty extensively. In fact, Cherokees probably went farther than any other Indian nation in this regard. They made their own constitution. A Cherokee Indian named Sequoia invented an alphabet for the Cherokee language, so they had newspapers and books written in Cherokee. Um, essentially, they modeled their political system uh, on the United States, hoping that by assimilating to white American values, they would protect themselves for the future. But uh, unfortunately, that is not the way it turned out for the Cherokee Indians, because it was the state of Georgia that uh, took the initiative and tried to take away the lands that belonged to the Cherokee and give them to um, white Georgians. Now, the Cherokee uh, appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States, and in two separate decisions, the Supreme Court said that the Cherokee were right and Georgia was wrong. They said that the Cherokee were uh, an independent nation that answered only to the national government of the U.S. and not at all to the state of Georgia, that the Cherokee did not have to obey Georgia law, and that they should not have to give up their land to the Georgia settlers. Well, when Andrew Jackson heard this reportedly uh, about the second Supreme Court decision, he said, John Marshall, the Chief Justice, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. In other words, um, it was his job as president to enforce the laws, and he had no intention of enforcing this Supreme Court decision. So um, Jackson simply ignored uh, the court's ruling and proceeded with plans to remove the Cherokee Indians to um, what is today Oklahoma. Uh, Jackson's idea was to set aside this faraway land in the West as a permanent Indian reservation where he hoped um, that Indians would be protected. He, he tried to present this as a way to protect um, the Cherokee and other Indian groups who would be moved to Oklahoma. But um, the removal to Oklahoma caused terrible suffering among the Cherokee people. When it was finally carried out in 1838, about 18,000 Cherokees set out on this journey and uh, about 4,000 of them died of, of the hardships along the way. And it's why we call it the Trail of Tears um, and a real black mark uh, on American history. Um, so, for all of these reasons, um, Jackson became known as uh, King Andrew <laughs> to those who didn't like him. And uh, his opponents in the political world claimed that he was trying to make himself a king, as you see there in that political cartoon on the right. And so, there emerged a new political party to challenge Jackson's new Democratic Party. This party was known as the Whigs. And that term, it, it doesn't have to do with a wig that you might wear on your head, 
Um, the term comes from British politics. The Whig Party in Britain was the party that was opposed to the powers of the king. Uh, and so essentially the new Whig Party was saying that they were going to do everything they could to take down King Andrew and to oppose him and all of his policies. So let's take a look at the differences between the Democratic Party and the Whig Party. Uh, the Democrats basically followed in the footsteps of Jefferson. <clears throat> Their leader and guiding spirit was Jackson. Um, as I said, they were hostile to big business. Uh, they were hostile to big money. They believed in small government in the great Jeffersonian tradition. They thought government should stay out of the economy, that business should be left to regulate itself. We call this free market or sometimes laissez-faire economics. Leave it alone, in other words. Um, the government should just stay out of the economy as much as possible. It should be as small as possible. Um, the Whigs, led by um, Henry Clay, Daniel we and Daniel Webster, uh, two great congressional leaders, took the opposite approach. And Henry Clay presented um, his platform for the Whig Party. He called it the American system. So basically, Clay wanted to raise taxes on imports, uh, tariffs on imported goods from other country. And he wanted to use the money to invest in the American business world, to promote manufacturing, um, and to promote uh, internal improvements like roads and, and canals uh, to help open up new markets and increase the American um, economy. He also wanted to charge high prices for federal land, again, to raise money for those kinds of improvements. So basically, Clay and the Whigs wanted a bigger government, one that was actively involved in the economy. Um, and actively involved in American life. So we have here two diametrically opposed parties that make up the second party system. We saw the first party system earlier, Republicans versus Federalists. This is the second party system, Democrats versus Whigs, that lasted from about 1834 to 1854. Um, the major political crisis under uh, Andrew Jackson's uh, administration uh, had to do with a high tariff that um, members of the future Whig Party got passed in 1828 that raised taxes on goods imported from England and other countries. Southerners called this the tariff of abominations. In other words, they didn't like the tariff because uh, they thought that by charging this high tariff on English goods that it would hurt them as cotton farmers who they were exporting cotton to England to be turned into cloth and this tax was going to reduce the sales of that cloth and it was going to hurt the British economy and therefore it was going to hurt their cotton sales to England. So southerners generally did not like tariffs and there was a lot of protest in the South over this 1828 tariff. <coughs> and uh, the leader of the protest was John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, who was Jackson's um, vice president. But um, Calhoun uh, became so militant about um, the tariff that he devoted himself to opposition to the tariff. Jackson replaced him on the ticket in 1832 with Martin Van Buren of um, New York State. And uh, in that same year, 1832, Calhoun got the South Carolina legislature to nullify the tariff. Now, you may recall that we mentioned this earlier. Jefferson's Kentucky Rev Resolution uh, which responded to the Alien and Sedition Acts passed under John Adams, said that states could nullify federal laws that they did not like, that is, cancel them, make them null and void. And so the South Carolinians basically were saying, we are not going to collect this tariff. The tariff is illegal in our state. Well, Andrew Jackson was a Southerner, but uh, he believed that uh, the federal government had to be supreme over the states on this tariff um, issue. And so publicly, Jackson threatened to march an army into South Carolina if the South Carolinians um, didn't back down. 
and um, he promoted the unity of uh, the United States government and the supremacy of federal law over uh, state uh, legislatures. But privately, behind the scenes, Jackson persuaded Congress to lower the tariff to a level that would be more acceptable to South Carolina. And so very effectively, uh, Jackson was able to defuse this conflict over the tariff and this nullification issue. But um, in the long run, of course, um, Southern hostility to Northern business interests towards tariffs that sought to encourage manufacturing in the North at the expense of Southern cotton farmers um, would lead to increasing tension during the run-up to the Civil War.